Okay, so I sort of got a bit carried away with the PowerPoint presentation, so um, I'm just going to let, let it happen. <laughs> <laughs> no Chinese doctors were hurt in filming about it. <laughs> so, anyway, when Jeremy, um, Jeremy asked me to talk and I said, like, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, well, like, what have you learned in, what's the most important thing you've learned in, like, 30 years of doing Chinese medicine? So, I thought, oh, well, you know, well, there's a few things. Um, so I was going to, I was going to give you sort of like the, the broad strokes of Chinese medicine and the and so on. But then I thought, you know what? If um, you know, like if the meteor meteorite lands tomorrow, and you know, there's one thing I'd want you guys to actually really truly understand, and that's about oxygen, and how how oxygen basically is the key, probably one of the most important things. I mean, people talk about. O uh, vitamin O and all sorts of stuff, but yeah, oxygen is, is probably the most important thing there is as far as our health is concerned, from my experience. So I'm going to sort of try and give you the, give you a bit of an idea about oxygen therapy. Hopefully, um, it'll be okay. But yet again, it's like the school project. <coughs> it should never let me anywhere near a computer. Okay, yep, I think we've had that bit. Okay, so uh, right. So when we see water flowing like this. This is sort of like how the Chinese see the body, is about flow. Now, water flows uh, over the rocks, it gets oxygenated, it gets cleaned, and of course, if we wanted to drink from said water, we'd probably be okay, because all the anaerobic bacteria and things like that has all been killed because of the oxygen in the water. Hence, the water is clean. Now, the way that the, the Chinese um, would look at the body, and of course, we're talking, whoops, the water also, uh, the body also has this flow, but the flow is a flow of energy. So as the energy flows through the body, it carries with it the blood, it carries with it the nutrition, and of course, where the energy moves, the blood is moving. So the blood is moving, the blood is carrying the oxygen to the to the tissue, and so the body is healthy because it's about the flow of the energy. So. <clears throat> Backwards. When that flow becomes stagnant, then the disease comes. So just the same like with the water, all the anaerobic bacteria gets going, all the parasites, uh, the protozoas, all these nasty... This is Indonesia, by the way. Uh, all the nasty things start to occur. So what we try to avoid is the stagnation in the body. So... Oxygen, eh? Let me see. Yeah, oxygen. Got to roll it backwards. Right. Good, good. So, <clears throat> I was a student for nine years with an old Chinese master. And uh, there was this one thing, one thing that he said, more than anything. I mean, I mean, I, he said a lot of things and I remembered pretty much all of it. But there was this one thing he said over and over again. The more oxygen you have in your body, the healthier you are. Like, that would be it. That's it. He just said it thousands of times to thousands of people. The more oxygen you have in your body, the healthier you are. So, in 1993, I was in my clinic in Melbourne, and uh, a guy came in, I, can't, I don't even know who it was anymore, but this guy came in with uh, some pamphlets, uh, uh, I mean a handful of notes, and it talked about oxygen therapy. Now the thing is, I took interest because I'd been told so many times that oxygen is really, you know, the more oxygen you have in your body, the healthier you are. So I looked at these notes and what he was talking about was hydrogen peroxide. Now the thing is, in 1993, 
HIV and hepatitis C was sort of rampaging out of control and the only things that they were using at that stage was AZT and interferon. I mean, interferon actually hadn't even started. So people were looking for alternate, alternate uh, means of trying to get some help. So I had, uh, at the time, I was working like incredibly hard. And so what he suggested I do is go get some hydrogen peroxide. So the type of hydrogen peroxide we're talking about is what's called food-grade hydrogen peroxide. It's not the stuff that you can go into the chemist and buy. So anyway, so I went off, I got hold of some 35% hydrogen peroxide and what was happening was at night I'd come home and I'd just sit in this armchair and I couldn't move for about two hours. I, was, I felt like my whole body was like lead. And so when I took the hydrogen peroxide, all of a sudden I felt like I had tons of energy. So all of a sudden I started feeling good. So what I did is I started giving hydrogen peroxide to my patients and they started to feel good too. They felt like they had lots of energy and a lot of their problems started to go away and of course all the things that the hydrogen peroxide was meant to have done started, started to work, you know. So I started to think, hey, oxygen therapy is really good, you know, it's saying to do what I, what I hope. Well, yep, keep rolling it. Okay, so the big thing about oxygen is oxygen has a major role in the immune system. So one of the things it does is it, the actual, our bodies actually create free radical oxygen. Now, hydrogen peroxide, I might have mentioned, is actually free radical. So when we're talking about free radical oxygen, what your body does is it's sort of a little bit like this. <coughs> it kind of hunts through the body looking for anaerobic bacteria, looking for viruses, looking for cancers, things like this. And when it finds it, it comes up and it actually starts creating free radical oxygen. Now, free radical oxygen is actually an unstable oxygen molecule because, as we all know, oxygen is, is O2. So it's like two molecules that have happily sitting beside one another. Look, like there's all this O2 all around me right now. So it's, it's, it's happy and it's stable. But what happens is when you split that oxygen molecule off, you get an unstable molecule. And what that molecule does is it quickly tries to bind with something else. So when it it binds with something else, it steals the electron from that thing that it's binding to, and then that thing is missing an electron, so it binds to the next thing and then it creates this chain reaction. And this is, this is oxidization. So our bodies actually shoot these little free radical oxygen molecules right at the source of the problem, sort of like arrows. But oxygen is not evenly distributed throughout the body. Like there's places that have really good blood supply and really good oxygenation and there's parts that have kind of pretty crappy blood supply and not very good oxygen oxygenation. So as a result, this lady doesn't kind of get everywhere all the time. So what happens is when you, when you introduce free radical oxygen, like you're taking the hydrogen peroxide for example, the oxygen floods through the body and just surges through every part and it kind of is a bit more like, whoops, this lady. <laughs> it's really aggressive. And it basically, it's there, it just blasts the body with the free radical oxygen and then it's gone. It disappears. And the body basically just goes back to being normal. So free radical oxygen was very, very useful. Okay. So yeah, hydrogen peroxide. Right. But there's another type of free radical oxygen, and it's this stuff. And basically what we're looking at here, do you know what makes the sky blue? They're not angels' tears. <laughs> it's ozone, right? So the blue of the sky is actually ozone. So when we're talking about ozone, we're talking about this, right? Ozone is another free radical oxygen because when, when ozone basically comes down to our level, it breaks off. It becomes oxygen and, and we end up with tons of free radical oxygen. So ozone is another form of free radical oxygen. However, it's kind of different to the hydrogen peroxide because it's taken differently. So let's see what this is. Okay, so free radical oxygen, in, in conclusion, Free radical oxygen is used in serious diseases such as cancer, HIV, hepatitis C. So I should say that in the almost 20 years that I've had experience with oxygen therapy,
there was nine solid years that I was treating cancer. And in that time, I was using ozone. So what we were doing is getting medical grade oxygen, running it through an ozone generator and producing this ozone gas, and then actually injecting the gas directly into the vein of the patient. And like a big, big cut, in some cases I've given like uh, three of those big syringes. And, okay, so just on the subject of cancer, that's it's right, the right time to talk about it. Anyway, so uh, what happened is there's three types of patients that were coming to me. One patient who was on chemotherapy and basically wanted to use ozone. The second type of patient, or I should say, with the first type, that patient was almost 100% success rate that that person was going to get better. I could almost guarantee they'd get better. Then the second type of patient was the type of patient who'd had chemotherapy and the chemotherapy hadn't worked and now they wanted to try the ozone. And in those cases, that was almost about a 50 to 60% success rate. And I've got, I've got a few amazing stories of some people. But anyway, and then there was a the type of person who basically only wanted to use ozone and didn't want to take chemo. And the people who took ozone actually had a higher success rate than the people who had the chemo first and then went to the ozone. So overall, the average was about an 80% success rate. So for nine years, I had an 80% strike rate with, with treating people of various... Some people was sort of over and some people it was sort of just beginning. For example, I'll, I'll ask you a question in a sec. <clears throat> but uh, for example, uh, there was a guy came to me and he said, uh, uh, you know, he said, like, what seems to be the problem? And he goes, um, I've got five weeks to live. So I thought, okay, so why are you here? You know, like, why aren't you, like, spending all your money and, you know, doing whatever it is that you'd like, probably be doing right now? Anyway, so he had his own story, but <laughs> he had pancreatic cancer. And uh, he'd basically gone to see the doctor. The doctor had opened him up, operated, looked at, looked at what had happened. His body, the cancer had metastasized all through his body. They just closed him up and said, look, we've got some bad news for you. It's worse than we thought. Uh, you've got about six weeks to go. You've got to make plans. So this guy's sitting in my office. And so I said, um, okay, so what, what do you think I can do? He said, well, you know, I just thought there might be something. Maybe you can help me. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not really ready for all this and so on. So I said, okay, well... Um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you some hydrogen peroxide and uh, some stabilised oxygen, which is sodium chloride. So I said, if you take this, um, and also I taught his wife how to hypnotise him, which is pretty cool. I said, look, just take this and, you know, go for broke and see what happens. So anyway, I didn't see that guy again. So I just um, naturally assumed he died. But um, three months later, I was looking at my appointment book and I saw this guy's name. I thought, can't be. Anyway, so two o'clock comes and this guy just rolls in, you know. So I said, um, so, you know, how's it going? He said, <laughs> he said oh, I'm Australian, by the way. So, so he, goes, um, he goes, I'm all better. And I, so, you know, I, the little doctor in my head goes, that's not possible. So um, I said, oh, well, that's great. You know, that's really good news. Well, keep up the good work and here's some more oxygen and, um, you know, and bring back your test results next time. You know, like, what's the plan? He goes, well, I've got another test in three months and, and so on. So anyway, so three months later, he comes back, he brings all his test results. And sure enough, his test results are there's nothing. Like, this guy has no more cancer. And so I asked him, uh, you know, I said, so why do you... This is, I always ask the same question. I said... Why do you think you got better? And so he said, you know, because of the oxygen and, you know, the stuff you said and blah, 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 you know, which was cool. And he came back, every three months he came back and it was the same sort of story until after about nine months he was like, well, you know, God he loves me and, you know, uh, and Jesus is in my life and all this stuff. And I'm like, that's cool. You know, that's really great. So that was that. I mean, this guy sort of just carried on. Um, now, look, not everyone was like that. There were some people I just sort of thought, you know, like, this person's got, person's got a really good chance here and, and, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work out like that. Anyhow, so, so free radical oxygen is used in the serious diseases like cancer, HIV, hepatitis C. Um, come on, baby, you know you want it. Oop, yep. 
<laughs> floods the body and then it's gone, leaves an elevated blood oxygen level. Okay. Right, so we've been talking about hydrogen peroxide, so we're talking about 35% food grade hydrogen peroxide, so that's not something you're basically going to go down and go to your local chemist because they'll sell you something which is stabilised hydrogen peroxide, it's got acid in it, and you can't actually take it orally. Um, so that's an IV infusion, not important at this stage, or you take, like I was doing, taking five drops in water and drinking it, okay? And ozone gas, medical grade oxygen, direct infusion. Hands up who just had some ozone today. Yeah, there's, oh, <laughs> two. All right, so, so Jeremy actually, Jeremy was talking to you after being injected with a massive amount of ozone gas into his vein, like it's hilarious. Uh, you know, he, he, he goes all like, you know, he sort of channels a bit for a while. I got his whole presentation actually in five minutes. Anyway, then there's autohemotherapy, which is basically where you take the blood out. This is the way they do it in Germany, where they take the blood out of the body first and they just eject the ozone into the bag of blood and then they hang the blood back up and it goes back into the body. Um, we have done that as well. Uh, the rectal or vaginal um, ozone, where you just actually just put the gas inside and absorb it, like that's pretty good for... It's, it's pretty good if you don't want to give people IVs, like if their um, veins have collapsed. But... Um, Say if you've got like cervical cancer, um, chlamydia, and uh, you know thrush, so it's pretty good for thrush. And major autohemotherapy, <laughs> just before we get off this subject, um, Indonesia is actually for all the things that it's sort of got wrong with it. One of the things that actually is amazing is it actually allows oxygen therapy here. So I didn't realise that when I bought all my equipment here that it's actually not illegal. So major autohemotherapy is where you actually sit in a big chair and they take your blood and they pump it through like a, um, a dialysis machine and the dialysis machine cleans your blood with ozone. And I've got a little picture here and this is, this is the blood coming out of the person. You see it's, it's like a really rich mahogany colour, deep mahogany, and the blood coming back in, which it doesn't quite show, but it's, it's like um, strawberry daiquiri, right? It is just so bright. So that's like coming out and that's coming back in again. So you see how, what it does to the blood, how it cleans? So that's a happy little patient sitting there. He'll probably be on that machine for a few hours and you know, it cost me a few hundred bucks, but it'll totally clean his body, his system. Anyway, now, so um, <laughs> first, we'll put a sense of earth. Anyway, so <laughs> to understand, <laughs> To understand the role of uh, how, to, how, how oxygen is in the body, right? We've got, oops, we've got to look back. We have to look back at history. Now, this is oxygen in, our, in, our, in the atmosphere over the last thousand million years. Now, what I just wanted to point out is sort of, sort of here is where life sort of actually way back over there sort of life started. But you see how there's these big peaks in oxygen where it basically gets up to 35%. This red line is kind of where we're at at the moment. So around here is sort of where we were. Like this is us when you know we crawled out of the primordial slime and all this sort of stuff. It's kind of in that, that part of the area. There's a big drop in oxygen, which I've, I'm not quite sure. They call it the oxygen crisis. I'm not sure. It wasn't the ice age. It was something else happened. But anyway, but the oxygen sort of came back up and then we got like about 32% oxygen. And now it's, it's just been slowly declining, declining to where it is now. Now you see in this little part here, all right, that is this, okay? 100,000 years ago, this was us, okay? Now you see, we haven't really changed much. You see the guy is sitting there and he's looking at the girls and he's sort of thinking, gee, how can I get out of doing the washing up? And they're just like, you know, and I was just telling you this story. Anyway, so one of the things about this is that the physiology of our bodies hasn't changed in hundreds of thousands of years. But what it has changed is that the atmosphere has changed. So if we were to take our caveman friend here and give him a bit of a, you know, like a makeover and maybe do the eyebrows a bit and uh, maybe bikini wax, hey, he just looks like any kind of guy you'd probably meet on the streets of Woodbury. <laughs> and of course we take our, our present day guy, as you can see there's absolutely no difference. <laughs> In fact if we took his organs we could probably interchange them. Anyway, moving along. So, so there's actually, 
another type of oxygen called stabilised oxygen. Now, stabilize, these are stabilised oxygen products which you may have seen or used or whatever. So, actually, the bulk of what I've done is been with stabilised oxygen. So, literally, thousands and thousands and thousands of people I've given stabilised oxygen to. And basically what stabilised oxygen is, as we talked about free radical oxygen, and it's unstable, stabilised oxygen is actually just oxygen, it's just O2, in these little salt solutions, okay? So basically how stabilised oxygen works is we take uh, tap water, tap water is about 8 parts per million oxygen, if we put in the stabilised oxygen, you can actually get up to 22,000 parts per million. So to understand that, it's like having 8 bucks in your pocket, or having 22,000 bucks in your pocket. It's a big difference. So what happens is when you actually take that in the water, you drink it, the um, stabilised oxygen comes down and hits the stomach acid. The hydrochloric acid in the stomach causes the sodium chloride, which is NaCl, everybody knows that's salt, causes it to actually separate away from the oxygen, like so, and then the salt just gets basically absorbed and the, the oxygen gets dragged into the, through the lining of the stomach and goes into your body. Now the body actually absorbs oxygen from all over the place. It doesn't just come in through the lung. It comes in through the skin, through the gut, through the rectum. It, pretty much everywhere it's exposed to air, it'll absorb oxygen. So what happens is when you elevate your blood oxygen levels like this, well, let's go back to the cavemen. Those guys had a very high blood oxygen level. Of t well, they had, a, they had a, lo a lot of oxygen in their environment. So there's a belief, a theory, maybe it's been proven by now, I don't know, but things like the anaerobic bacteria and things like that, the sort of problems that we get nowadays, they didn't have because the oxygen just basically just wiped all that stuff out. So when you're introducing oxygen to the body, you get the kind of the same effect. So it's science. So what happens, right? When your autoimmune system is using oxygen, it becomes incredibly robust, right? In fact, it's like I've given it to so many people and I know exactly what happens. Nothing. When the people use, use stabilised oxygen, they are, always have energy. They've always got tons of energy. They never get sick, right? Never get sick. And if they do get a flu, like just remember flus are very virulent nowadays, the flus will basically come for a day and then they're gone. I, I've got a technique for how to, how to blast yourself with the oxygen, get over it quickly. So it's, pre or also hangovers, man. If you ever come home like totally wasted, you just get the oxygen and you squirt into it like an orange juice bottle of uh, you know, eight ounce or or orange juice, drink it, fall into bed, wake up fresh as a daisy. I mean, you could make millions, <laughs> literally millions, millions of like Microsoft millions by selling it as a cure for a hangover. Now the thing is, if we don't, we don't have this oxygen in our bodies, we tend to just sort of kind of be winging it, and it, it relies on other factors whether or not we're going to get sick. So, okay, 1918, this is a somber note, okay, 1918, this is the Spanish flu, okay, when we got hit by the Spanish flu. Now the Spanish flu had a 10 to 20 percent mortality rate. Okay, so that means that all these people you see in this photograph, by the end of the day, one in ten of these people will be dead. By the end of three days, one in five. That was the reality of the Spanish flu. Now, the reason why three to five percent of the world's population got wiped out. Now, the reason why I've presented this is because since 1918, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Western medicine has no cure for this. And if it does happen, which it will happen, because it's, it's every hundred years it happens, and we're kind of overdue, it's, we'll be overwhelmed, okay? But let's face it, not everyone died, so four out of five people got better, okay? So, let me see what's next. Oh yeah, so there was this guy, Father Richard Wilhelm, at the height of the Spanish flu, Richard Wilhelm started using hydrogen peroxide and he started giving people hydrogen peroxide infusions because out of desperation, people didn't know what to do. And he lowered this mortality rate to zero. So all the people that he treated got better. 
he wrote about, he was one of the pioneers of hydrogen peroxide and he, he created societies to do with the education of hydrogen peroxide and so on. Heard much about it? Not much. Okay, here's another guy, Dr. Otto Warburg. Dr. Otto, in 1931, he made a great discovery. All normal cells have an absolute requirement for oxygen, but cancer cells can live without oxygen, a rule without exception. Deprive a cell 35% of its oxygen for 48 hours and not may, but it will become cancerous. Cancerous tissues are acidic, another very interesting point that we can't talk about now. And most importantly, cancer cannot survive in high levels of oxygen. Dr. Otto. Now, heard about Dr. Otto? Dr. Otto won the Nobel Prize for his discovery. How interesting. Okay. Now, Dr. Otto, being a smart cookie, he came back the next year and tried to win it again with ozone because he showed that with ozone it destroyed the cancer. But anyway, I think you've just got a, an honourable mention. Now, you probably know why you haven't heard about this because you know what this is? All right, here it comes. <laughs> Okay, so big pharma means big pharmaceutical companies. So what happened is when Dr. Otto Warburg and Father Richard Wilhelm were basically showing the world the benefits of oxygen, big pharmaceutical companies were also getting started. This is the 1920s, 1930s. Now we have the pharmaceutical companies, basically they've got all the money, they've got billions of dollars. They use that money and they fund the FDA, which is the Federal Drug Administration in the States, and they also fund scientific research. Now, the thing about oxygen therapy, which means why we don't use it, it's illegal in all these other countries, things like this, is because it's an unpatentable medicine. So these guys are not going to pay money f for research on something that basically they can't own it. Okay? You can't own oxygen. So, ox so not only have they sort of turned their back on oxygen, but they've aggressively tried to destroy people who practice oxygen therapy and the information associated with oxygen therapy. Because all the people, all the people that I have known who have been proponents of oxygen therapy, who've used oxygen therapy openly, have all gone to jail. Even, even my hero, um, Dr. Atkins, you know the Atkins diet? He was an oxygen therapy doctor as well, and he almost came within that close of losing his medical license. Very interesting. So, the Chinese look at the body about flow, okay? It's all about flow, and as the body, the energy flows, the oxygen moves, the body is healthy, okay? This wonderful interrelationship. Conversely, Western medicine looks at the body as always, always on the edge of collapse, always needing some sort of intervention just to keep it going, you know? It's just so useless, so rotten. Unfortunately, we've got these two dichotomies, you know, but this is kind of what drives us. And that's why oxygen therapy is underground. It's underground. So people like me are kind of like the resistance. So, <laughs> but the thing is, I've, uh, because I've been using it for almost 20 years, and the number of people I've given it to, without, without exception, I mean, oh, anyway, some, some people might get diarrhea if they take too much, or, you know, like this sort of stuff, but, you know, <laughs> so what, they get over it, you know? <laughs> it's, it's benign, you know, like, what, what could possibly go wrong? Anyway, so, yeah, it's a, um, it's illegal in pretty much everywhere except, uh, I think, like Germany they do it, and uh, Mexico, I'm pretty sure. There might be one or two more countries Canada. like Indonesia. Canada. And Canada, yeah, Canada. So there you go. So oxygen therapy is just one of those things. So guys, my recommendation to you is understand oxygen. And if you have access to sodium chloride, which of course I've got some on coming, but, and sodium chloride is fairly inexpensive by the way, but if, if you take sodium chloride like 10 drops of sodium chloride every morning, you'll have tons of energy, you'll never get sick, you'll be great, like this sort of stuff, totally bulletproof. If you don't want to take the oxygen because you, you just don't think you need to take it, 
have it in the back of your fridge. Just have it there just in case. Because that little bottle of sodium chloride can save you and your friends and your loved ones in a time of crisis. And unfortunately, we are that time, I mean, it's not coming soon, like all this sort of stuff, but the thing is, it can happen. Every time we get one of those little bird flu scares, that's like a really near miss, you know, because it could really just go into another pandemic and there'll be nothing that you can do. So this is why tonight I'm giving you this message. That's it.